If you will go ahead and open your Bible to the book of Proverbs to chapter 25 and verse 16. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 16. Sounds like we're getting a little bit of the sound back. Uh, it's, if you wiggle a wire here, wiggle a while there, you may get something. So uh, but we're going to try to do the best we can. Um, let's begin our reading this morning in chapter 25, verse 16. We'll take verses 16 and 17 together. Have you found honey? Eat only as much as you need, lest you be filled with it and vomit. Seldom set your foot in your neighbor's house, lest he become weary of you and hate you. Now, the very first thing that we would notice here, he's talking about getting too much of a good thing. Have any of you ever experienced verse 16? I would dare say so. I was trying to think of the best illustration that I could think of it. Uh, the best one I can think of was several years ago when Brother Bo came from Thailand. I don't know if many of you remember Bo. Uh, he's a nice young man from uh, uh, Thailand and went to the Memphis School of Preaching. And his first day here, he came and uh, I said, Bo, I want to take you out to eat. I'm going to carry you to Prater's Barbecue. And so Bo and Micah and I went to Prater's Barbecue, and I said, Bo, order anything you want. So he ordered a jumbo barbecue, slaw, and fries. And of course, Bo was probably used to eating what you could put in the palm of one hand. And he ate most of the barbecue, most of the fries, and about a third of the slaw. And he says, I can't eat anymore. And we got in the truck, and he was moaning in the corner. And I said, Bo, what's wrong? Oh, Brother Tony, I'm so miserable. <laughs> and uh, what it was, he had been raised in an environment where you didn't have much to eat. And so when you gave him all he wanted to eat, he felt like he needed to eat it all. But he couldn't. Physically couldn't do that. And... Uh, we often use that as a, a sort of a phrase among us is that uh, I'm so miserable. Uh, that's, uh, I understand why he was because I think all of us have been there. But now let's take that to what Solomon is saying in this passage. Have you found, honey, eat only as much as you need lest you be filled with it and vomit? What he's saying is, is there's sometimes you can get too much of something that in itself is good. And uh, I will tell you, if you go to chapter 25 and look at verse 27, he says there, it is not good to eat much honey, so to seek one's own glory is not glory. He's applying that in that context to a person who would uh, take it and go too far with it. Uh, I would think about a person, for instance, who is very smart. But when you get to the point where a person is so smart, they're trying to answer all the questions and they're trying to let you know how smart they are, then how does it look? You, you go from saying he's smart to he's a smart aleck. You say a person is good, and then you say he's a goody two-shoes. You understand the point I'm trying to say? It has to do with the perception of that. And uh, then you would say, okay, how does that tie with verse 17? Seldom set your foot in your neighbor's house, lest he become weary of you and hate you. Is it okay to go and visit your friends? Yes. I've had friends that come, and I was glad to see them come. I've also had friends that I was glad to see them go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, his point here is the fact that you can overdo a good thing. And I think in the context here, when you look at verse 27, it's... To look, you got to put it in the context of going back to chapter uh, 25, verse 1. We said these are the, the uh, Proverbs that the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, had sought out. That tells you that these are things that relate to a king. Can a king get to believing the praises of men? 
Will people tell a king that he's a great person when in reality he may not be a great person? Yes. Let me give you a really good biblical illustration. In Acts chapter 12, verses 21 through 23, we read about King Herod. And when King, they, they couldn't stand Herod. But he comes and he gives this great speech. And they say, the voice of a God and not of a man. And uh, old Herod's like, yeah, they love me. They love me. And you know what God did? St struck him with worms. Uh, I think in this, he's trying to indicate here that a person ought not to become so full of themselves to think they're so valuable to others, they're so desirable to others that they can just treat them any way they want to. And for a king, that was some very important lessons to be learned. Anybody have any additional thing you want to add to verses 16 and 17? Okay, let's go to verses 18 and 19. A man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a club, a sword, and a sharp arrow. Confidence in an unfaithful man in the time of trouble is like a bad tooth and a foot out of joint. Now, uh, looking at verse 18, what kind of person is one who's bearing false witness? He's a liar. You know, if you go back to chapter 14 and you look at verse 5, it says, A faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness utters lies. He's telling error, falsehood. And uh, so if a person is lying, uh, he said here he is doing that against his neighbor, he describes it as three battle armaments. And uh, I thought it was valuable to go back and study this. Do you know what a club is? It's a big stick. But do you know that in ancient times, the way they created their battle ornaments with a club was to take and put spikes in it? It's actually called a mace. Uh, and uh, what it is, is just imagine a big baseball bat with spikes sticking out of it. That was meant to inflict harm on someone else. Then you got the sword, and a sword was also another battle armament, uh, maybe like a, a dagger or a, what I would call a medium-sized sword. We tend to think of these really long swords, but if you go back and look at antiquity, their swords were generally uh, not that large because they were used as more of a uh, uh, close to close, you know, combat. And then a sharp arrow. Now, uh, an arrow was what was shot with a bow, and that was an armament that you would use at a distance to try to, in, to inflict harm on someone. Uh, one of the commentaries made this comment, and I thought it was so well written that I couldn't improve on it. He said, the sage depicts a false witness as beating out his neighbor's brains with a mace and piercing his bowels with a sword and killing him with a deadly arrow in order to make the son shrink from the horror at the, paw, the thought of perjury. In other words, he's trying to use the idea of somebody clubbing someone, someone stabbing a person, is how bad it is to perjure yourself or to tell a lie about someone. Does that make good sense? And I think that would, for a king, to understand the, the seriousness of lying and of perjury. But when you add verse 19 to it, confidence in an unfaithful man. You know, if I've got somebody out here and I want to send them on a journey to uh, relay a message, do you want somebody you can trust? You can have confidence in? You sure do. What happens if you trust somebody to do something and they betray that trust? You don't trust them anymore. But you bear the consequences of it, do you not? You have to clean up the mess because if I send somebody to tell Alan something and he says, you know what, I'm going to 
mess with him on this. I'm going to tell him something different. And then when Alan says, no, Tony, why did you say that? I didn't say that. Well, that's what this guy said. You know, and then he's created seeds of doubt. He's created all kinds of difficulty. He said that is like a bad tooth and a foot out of joint. Do bad teeth hurt? Absolutely. You know, uh, that's probably the worst pain I've ever had in my life is a bad tooth. Uh, or you can't get any relief from it. And then a foot out of joint. How bad does it hurt when you've twisted your ankle and try to get around? You know, remember, they didn't have these little uh, carts nor uh, boots that you could wear back then. If, how did you get around if you had a foot out of joint? Limp? Walk with a stick? You didn't get around. I mean, you look at all of what he's saying there, and he's trying to paint a picture here so that people will appreciate the importance of telling the truth and telling it all the truth the way that it's supposed to be represented. And he said, if it doesn't, it's like being beat up in a battle or it's like having a bad uh, joint or a bad tooth. Okay, anybody have any comments on verses 18 and 19? Let's take verse 20. Like one who takes away a garment in cold weather, and like vinegar on soda, is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. Now, I've titled this Misplaced Humor. Uh, is there a time and a place for everything? Yes. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 4 says... There's a time to laugh and a time to mourn, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Um, when you are going through a period of mourning, do you want humor? No. In fact, a person who tries to promote humor at a time of sadness creates anger. Because you, you, you'd think, why would a person do that to me? You know, this is a time I'm suffering. Don't try to make light of it. Don't try to make it something unimportant. Um, there's a passage that I really think is helpful here. The book of Ecclesiastes, and we're going to be studying that in our summer series. But in chapter 7 and verses 2 through 4, he says, Better to the go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men. And the living will take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance a heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Now, uh, what Solomon is saying is there's more to be learned from times of trouble than there are from times of laughter. And yet there's some people, everything has to be a joke to them. And uh, sometimes people who are trying to cheer up a person who is grieving tries to cheer them up in the wrong way. I think it's important when a person is grieving to let them grieve, to express compassion, to express sympathy, not to make a joke out of it, and uh, because it's rarely appreciated. Well, now, let's look at the illustration that he's going to use here. Like one who takes away a garment in cold weather. Uh, right now, the weather's not cold, but it was just a few months ago. And you know, unless you're Marty, uh, and just really love cold weather. But what happens if you take away a person's jacket? They're uncomfortable. In fact, it may even be painful to them. Uh, I know a lot of people who, when they get cold, it's not just a matter of they don't like it. It's uncomfortable to the point of pain to them. And uh, he says, like one who takes away a garment in cold weather. And then he uses a second illustration here. 
And he says, light one uh, vinegar on soda. And now, uh, uh, what does vinegar and soda do together? Effervescent, yeah. It's like your uh, uh, effervescent. I was trying to think of the name of the, you know, the stuff people put their dentures in, you know, the bubbling and stuff like that. Uh, that's the idea of it. Let me offer to you, there's uh, some of the early Greek translations for the word soda there. There's like a one or two word or letter difference in the word. But the word there is the word instead of soda is the word for wound. And like vinegar on a wound. Now, in that case, uh, it changes a little bit of the meaning. What happens if you pour something that is acidic into a wound many times? You know, it's not very appreciative. Uh, we wouldn't use that kind of illustration today. What term would we say about putting into a wound? Salt into a wound. Uh, to me, in the context, if you're looking as a parallel here, that seems to make a little more sense in the sense of like a person who takes away your garment in cold weather or like a person who pours vinegar in a wound. That would be very painful. Uh, it's one who sings songs to a heavy heart. He doesn't appreciate the fact that you're inflicting more pain on him. At a time he's already enduring pain, he doesn't want more pain uh, to be inflicted on him. Anybody else? Ber That's the last thing you want to hear when you're... Uh, no. Yeah, there, there's all kinds of things that you should not say. And you may think they're funny now until you're in that position. When you're in that position, then it's not funny and, and also not appreciating. Okay, let's look at verses 21 through 23. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. The north wind brings forth rain, and a backbiting tongue, and angry countenance. Now let's notice verse 21 here. Paul quotes this in the book of Romans, chapter 12, in verses 20 and 21. Now, um, uh, What's the idea of trying to overcome the wickedness in our enemies? How are we supposed to do this? In other words, instead of returning evil for evil, you return good for evil. And uh, you treat him good rather than treating him bad. What is the best way to deal with an enemy? Make a friend out of him. Because if you make a friend out of him, he's no longer your enemy. And sometimes all you need to do is to treat a person good in order to have that person become your friend. Uh, I've used this illustration before, but uh, when I first started preaching, there was a congregation I was working at, had a young man in it, about the same age I was, and uh, I taught that age class. He was one of the elder sons, and uh, he was, I, I thought every Sunday morning his idea was, let's go see how we can embarrass Tony today. And uh, it doesn't take much to embarrass me, and it doesn't take much to embarrass a young preacher. And uh, I got to the point where I was about ready to quit. I mean, I was just about ready to give up. I felt like if this is what it is, you know, why try? And uh, people in the congregation were actually going to the elders and saying, y'all need to back this guy off. He's just making his life miserable. And he was. And uh, so I decided, how am I going to do this? You know, how am I going to deal with this? I'm not going to give up. 
So what I did, I tried to make him a friend and did. And uh, I don't know if he started trying, but we ended up being good friends over this. And, uh, but could I have responded to the way I thought he was treating me in a negative way? What good would it have done? It would have fueled the fire. It would also have made me look in the same way that he was being looked at. It also probably would not have resolved the matter at all, would it? It only would have hurt the class more than it was, and it probably would have made me think, okay, this is the way you handle all the problems that you meet. It's just give them uh, what they give you. Return evil for evil. Well, in doing so, it makes that person look bad. It makes everyone else not appreciate that person. But now let's look at it another way here. If your enemy is hungry, you give him bread to eat. If he's thirsty, you give him water to drink. Now notice this word right here. What's that word for indicate? The result. You know, this is your motivation. This is a result from it. You will heat coals of fire on his head. Now, in doing this, this is going to make that person in a worse position because if you treat them good and they're treating you evil, what's that going to make him look like to everybody else? Okay. That he's the troublemaker, not you. It's his problem, not your problem. Number two, it makes you look like you're the person who's trying to do what's right. But there's another sense in which that this person here having coals of fire heaped upon their head sometimes realizes, you know what? I shouldn't have been doing this. They may actually start feeling guilty for the way they've been treating somebody else and then turn and change their ways. That's what you're seeking, isn't it? Hmm? Sure, you can, tr you can take people and change them by treating them right and treating them good. And, uh, you know, and verse 23 fits with it perfectly well. The north wind brings forth rain. Uh, when you see that wind coming from the north, particularly in the Bible lands, you know that with it is going to be bringing rain from the Mediterranean Sea. That's the way the, the jet stream works. Where does most of our moisture come from? The Gulf. The winds come from the west, but the moisture comes from the Gulf. When you have a low pressure system that is spinning this way, <laughs> it's pulling up the moisture from the Gulf of Mexico. And then when that colder air coming from the north hits that warmer uh, moist air, what does it do? Brings forth rain. When you have the north wind coming and the rain being brought or the moisture being brought from the Mediterranean Sea, that's going to bring about rain. And he says, so the north wind brings forth rain, but he said a backbiting tongue brings what? An angry countenance. So if, and notice that backbite, you bite me and I say, I'm going to bite you back. What does that bring about? More bite, more anger. In other words, what you're going to do, instead of resolving this, you're going to escalate it. You're going to make it worse than it was to start with. Does that ever happen in homes and in families? Where rather than trying to resolve a matter by being good, we say, I'm going to give it back to them just like they give it to me. Well, they decided to raise the stakes a little bit. Thing 
he keeps saying the same thing, just using a little bit different words. But is that not the way our parents taught us? Saying pretty much the same thing. Of course, mine used the same words over and over again. It is, but then again, it's hard for them to be mean to you when you're being nice back to them. It, you know, if somebody's chewing you out and you say, I, I agree with you, you're, you're right, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're uh, you know, trying to be as respectful to them as you can, then it's hard for them to just keep heaping it on because they're like, well, I guess I feel like a fool now. So... Well, let me ask you, how did the Lord deal with people who was angry at him often? You remember as they were, he'd get down and he'd ride on the ground. They would say something and they'd marvel that he didn't say anything back. You can always be quiet. And uh, that doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but you can always be quiet. But in treating them right is the best way to do it. Okay, let's go to Ver Alan. I don't know what it would do, but at least it didn't escalate the problem. It, it uh, let her see that he was not going the direction she wanted it to go. Okay, let's take verse 24 here and uh, uh, see what he says, because I think you probably heard this before. It is better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Does Solomon use this idea more than once? Yes. Back in chapter 21 in verse 9 and close to that in chapter 21 in verse 19. He does not have a bad view of women. Solomon really praises good women. He talks about the worthy woman who can find her prices far above rubies. He said if a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing and obtains the favor of the Lord. But the problem is, he says, the wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 1. Um, I think it's important to realize that there are times in our families where it's best for us to go to the other end of the house. And that's what he's saying here. It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop, you just get as far away from it as you can, than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Uh, and I think in the context of what he has just said in verses 21 through 23, talking about a backbiting tongue brings forth anger, what happens in a marriage and in a home when you return evil for evil? 
It's going to go downhill. It's going to go downhill quickly. And uh, so rather than being in the presence, back yourself out of it. Give it a chance to calm down and to quiet down and uh, try to find a real great solution. Okay, we need to move on to verses 25 and 26. As cold water is to a weary soul, so is good news from a far country. A righteous man who falters before the wicked is like a murky spring and polluted water. Now, um, you may not see how these two go together to begin with, but um, what about a reliable witness? We talked about an unreliable one just earlier. How good is a reliable witness? Well, he's going to use an illustration. Uh, how many of you have been out mowing grass and it's just hot as it can be, or maybe you're working in the field, in the garden, and you're just sweating, and I mean, you're just uh, famished, and somebody says, here, I've got you a, a bottle of cold water. It's got ice in it. We don't work in the field like we used to. Some do. I, I was thinking of you, Willie, but uh, that cold water is so refreshing it, it, you know, it gives you, it sort of makes you feel better. Good news from a far country, what does that do to a person? Lift your spirits, makes you feel like, you know, things are going in the right direction. You know, things are improving. Uh, ever so often, you know, we hear so much negative stuff on the news. And then you hear somebody who did something good. It's just sort of like, whew, I'm, I'm glad for that. It's, it's something appreciated, something wanted. Well, uh, you go back to chapter 25 and verse 13, and he says there, like cold of snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him, for he refreshes the soul of his masters. That's the, the thought in mind here. But now let's pair that with verse 26. A righteous man who falters before the wicked. Now, uh, before we look at the latter part of it, does a righteous man ever falter? When does he generally falter? When he's being supported and encouraged by the good? When he's before the wicked, I look at what he said earlier about a man who's mistreating us, treating us badly, and uh, that's when I generally am going to respond badly if somebody's treating me badly. Rather than doing the right thing, I may do the wrong thing. Now, I, I didn't plan on doing that. I wasn't wanting to do that, but uh, it just hit me in a moment of weakness. How many of you have ever popped off at somebody who said something to you that they shouldn't have said? And when you popped off, what happened to you? Didn't make you look too good. You got on the same level as they were. So a righteous man who falters before the wicked, but then notice what he says about him. He is like a murky spring and a polluted well. Now what does that mean? Distasteful and undesirable? Okay, poisoned. He said something very similar to that. Go ahead. Okay. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, what Willie read to us about dead flies and the perfumer's ointment. In other words, uh, you're mixing this beautiful, sweet-smelling uh, ointment, but you put some dead flies in it, how's it going to smell? Foul odor. In other words, something's bad about this. I've, you know, I've gone sometimes and they say, oh, this is women's perfume, and you say, oh, whew, you know, <laughs> this don't smell good. 
uh, like, did this as essence de skunk or something? You know, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, he's saying that a wise man who exhibits folly at the wrong time, that's what it shows him to be. Well, if you take a righteous man and you put something bad in him, here's what he becomes. Murky waters is water you can't depend on because you can't tell if it's clean or not. And in fact, if you go to Ezekiel 34, verses 18 and 19, he uses this illustration there about uh, the animals getting in the water. What do they do when they get in the water? They pollute it with, number one, the, they bring the mud in, they stir the mud up, but then there's the excrements that is also being left in the water, and they're polluting, so it's murky and it's polluted. And uh, if I begin to participate in sinful behavior, unrighteousness, what does it my life look like? Polluted. Uh, people can't tell whether I'm righteous or not. They can't look at me and say, well, you know, he's a good guy, because they can't be certain, they can't be sure of that. Um, Religion right now is taking a real black eye in the eyes of the world. What's happened in the Southern Baptists where they've had hundreds of people who've sexually molested other people, or whether it's the Catholic Church, or whether it's members of the church that's gotten involved in uh, illicit affairs, does that somehow make us all religious people look bad? To the point where people would look and say, Hey, I just don't know if I want to be a part of that or not. We become murky waters, polluted waters that people can't be certain about. And so the warning in this for Solomon is make sure that you do not uh, let yourself become that. Okay, let's go to verses 27 and 28, which will probably be all the time we will have for today. It is not good to eat much honey. So to seek one's own glory is not glory. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Now, uh, again, we're going to go back to the honey. And uh, is honey good? Do you like sweet things? What happens if you eat too much sweets? Okay. I illustrated with Bo earlier about eating too much. Well, uh, when I was probably third grade, fourth grade, we had one of the kids in class that had a birthday. His parent brought popcorn balls. I hadn't seen those much since I was a kid. But if you don't know what popcorn ball is, popcorn's rolled in something sweet. I don't even know how they make them. But I know that uh, they were good. Teacher said, all right, everybody come up and get you a popcorn ball. And I gnawed on that thing. It was just wonderful. There were some left and said, you want an, anybody else want a second one? Guess what? <laughs> I never had a popcorn ball. I didn't know how good those things were. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, you get too much sweets, you know what happens? It just makes you sick. So to seek one's own glory is not glory. That's something Solomon has talked about frequently. Um, we, go, we go back to verse 16 that we already covered. But um, how, do, how do we look at people who are self-promoters? Any of you like somebody who can tell you how smart they are? I found out most people that I know are smart, I figured that out a long time before they told me. And, uh, you know, honesty is the same way. And uh, so he says it's not good to seek one's own glory. And uh, now you can say, well, how do you, how do you take that and apply that with verse 28? Whoever has no rule over his own spirit 
Some people just can't seem to stop bragging. And you say, well, why can't they stop? Because they have no self-control. And Solomon is saying that's like a city with walls that are broken down without, you know, the walls are broken. There, there's no sense of his self-restraint and no defense of who he is. Well, our time's up, so we'll start with chapter 26 next Sunday morning.